So I'm sick of this stuff. We have to talk about it because the American people think the reason for inflation is government spending more money. Simply not true. I'm getting what I deserve. I'm reaping what I sow. I'm... Today is Sunday, March 13th. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's start with this. In focus tonight. The mystery of the VIX. Stocks going down, but so was the VIX. What is the reason behind that? We'll explore. But before we do that, have you seen those prices at the pump? Oh, what a pain. Soon enough, they're gonna classify these gas stations as X-rated from all the screwing going on in there. Today, I went to the station to fill my car with gas. i never seen so many disappointed faces since the last time I was at McDonald's drive through and they told us the ice cream machine is out. Are they ever going to have a working ice cream machine in McDonald's again? Anyways, folks, this green energy lunacy is working as intended, isn't it? For example, last year, the best performing asset in the world was coal. Yep, dirty coal, the top performing commodity in 2021. So far this year, the top performing asset is oil, followed by commodities, gold, and the US dollar. Bitcoin is the worst performer, followed by stocks. So again, all of this green energy lunacy is pushing the price prices of fossil fuels higher and higher and higher, and also pushing the prices of these metals and materials that go into the production of EV batteries higher and higher and higher. It is a failure on both fronts, no doubt about it, yet the administration continues to be delusional about the problem. Commodities across the board, be it energy, be it softs, be it grains, be it metals, these prices are moving higher and higher and higher by the day, because once again, the source of this inflation is monetary. It's always been that way, always. When the Fed printed trillions out of thin air, aka the cocaine operation, to prop up the equities and real estate markets, well, this is the end result. It's always been this case. You have an increase, add a whack increase in this case, in the money supply, you're gonna see immediately an inflation in commodities. And so far, the top performing commodity is wheat. Why wheat? Because the Russia-Ukraine conflict poured more gasoline on the fire of inflation. And these two countries combined happen to be the top producers of wheat on the planet. But we're seeing it across the board, folks. In metals, in livestock, in energy commodities, in corn, in oats, the only commodity that is losing year to date is OJ, orange juice. So I guess uh, let them drink OJ and maybe eat EVs. But anyways... This inflation has no end in sight, and the green energy lunacy will continue to prop up this inflation higher and higher and higher. Look no further than what's going on with the prices of nickel, one of the critical components of EV batteries. Prices spiked so high, they had to halt trading of nickel across the London exchange market. And so far, the trading remains suspended. What is the point here? What is the end game? This is a question all of us must ask. And this volatility, folks, is causing disruption. In global financial markets because we're seeing that tsunami of margin calls starting to roll and this is a dangerous development so far because it could exacerbate the losses in the stock market and we know at this point that we have an economy that traces the stock market and if we get into a scenario where the losses in the stock market are exacerbated because of margin calls we will see severe damage in the economy job losses right away the pace of economic activity will drop like a rock we will see this economy moving into the most painful stage of stagflation. An example of the margin calls, of course, you've heard what's going on in Shanghai with the firm that is blowing up because they got caught with an enormous short position on nickel. But now we have more firms. For example, we have a Morgan Stanley trader who got fired because he racked up over $50 million in losses. Because so far, Wall Street, at least since 2009, has been riding an easy ride, riding the wave of the Fed's liquidity. Stocks only go up so long as the Fed continues to buy. And they've been gambling, using risky strategies, 
by dividends and credit swaps to achieve massive profits. All of these strategies are starting to fire back this year so far because the market hasn't been going up. This is the danger, the hidden danger, the hidden accelerator that could intensify the crash. Hamza al Hassani, who traded dividends in the New York-based bank's equities division, will be departing after transactions he oversaw went awry. The losses tied to him were less than $50 million, one of the people said. Now, this is one trader, by the way, racking up $50 million worth of losses. And there are more to come. Because this insane market volatility that we're seeing right now will induce more margin calls across the board. And we have no idea who are the cockroaches hiding under the rock. We will know once the rock is lifted. That is the danger here. You see the stock market goes down by 3%. The next day it's up 3%. Then the day after it's down 3%. This roller coaster ride will cause margin calls to start to hit. Even Goldman Sachs is now cutting the S&P 500 outlook for the second time this month. Why? Here's why. And it is absolutely alarming. Goldman says we now see the risk that the U.S. enters a recession during the next year as broadly in line with the 20 to 35 percent odds currently implied by models based on the slope of the yield curve. The top Wall Street strategist cut his 2022 U.S. GDP forecast to a growth of 1.75 percent from the 2 percent previously. The consensus estimate are looking for a 2.7 percent increase. So everything that was priced in the stock market for a 2.7 percent increase has to be priced out because we're now looking at a recession, not economic growth. And perhaps an important indicator for the sentiment in the market right now is this. IPOs are bailing out. Back in 2021, at least in the first and second quarters, we have witnessed the tsunami of IPOs. Garbage companies IPOing at ridiculous prices, which we now know were nothing mere a trap for the retail crowd, the mom and pops. On the other hand, the insiders got away rich. This is a scam. And where is this EC, you might ask? The SEC remains in a coma. But now we have Shobani calling out the IPO. And many other companies also calling out IPOs. Not going to happen. Why? Because market conditions are not favorable anymore. We're seeing a lot of de-risking. And the dominoes are falling, folks. Ten trillion dollars was wiped out of global equities so far we're only in march and there is more to come but rest assured we have pumper from neptune fraud star tom lee and he says yes the market has been far more treacherous than he expected but the s p 500 will rally again to 5100 or higher by year's end oh really look at what's going on with the technical indicators for example the nasdaq the 50 days moving average has already crossed below the 200 days moving average. We call this the death cross. Because once this happens, absent of a quick reversal, it means that something is changing in whatever chart you're looking at. In this case, the chart in the NASDAQ. What is this change, you might ask? A reversal from the previous trend. And the previous trend was a bullish one. We're now changing from a bullish trend to a bearish trend aka we are already in a bear market yet the pumpers the tom lees and the likes continue to pump because that is their job this is what they get paid to do what about the dow jones the dow jones is about to cross the death cross is about to happen in the dow jones just like you saw with the nasdaq and soon enough, even the S&P 500, which Tom Lee says it's going to be over 5,100 by the end of the year, even the S&P 500 is about to get hit with a death cross as the 50 days moving average is about to cross below the 200. And again, look at these indicators. You really think that the 50 days moving average is going to curl its way higher again, absent of a miracle? And what is that miracle, by the way? It is the Federal Reserve intervention. Ask yourself a question again. Is the Fed really going to intervene to save the equities market when we have this insane, out of whack inflation? Think again. Yes, this time it is different. It is different the fact that the Fed is out of ammo. Now, you might think that we have peak bearishness. Everybody's talking about the crash. Everybody's talking about equities dropping, bailing out in the stock market. The good days are over. Stocks are down 70, 80, 90% in certain cases. You might think that, hey, it could be a bottom. You could be closer to a bottom and a buying opportunity. After all, when Warren Buffett says, when everybody is fearful, it is time to be greedy. But this is where the Robin Hoodians and the morons get it wrong. Are we seeing legitimate fear? 
in the stock market, meaning complete capitulation? Or are we continue to see attempts to buy the dip and calls that the stock market will finish the year higher? It's a very important question to ask because when we look at certain indicators, we find out that we have yet to reach these capitulation levels where we can say comfortably that everybody's bearish right now, everybody's bailing out, nobody's calling for the stock market recovery, and hence, it is time to buy. We're not there yet. Things could get a lot worse. For example, when we look at short selling all in all, we're not seeing any shorting happening in the grand scheme of things. Look at back at the 06 to 09 bubble. There was a lot of shorting because a lot of traders and investors knew ahead of time that this is an insane bubble. It's gonna crash and we should start shorting. Not anymore. If anything, the capitulation happened on the side of shorts. They're so afraid of shorting because the Fed has been serving them pies in the face every single time by rescuing the market over and over and over again. So we could see a tsunami, a surge of shorting all of a sudden, and this will exacerbate the pain in the stock market. So be careful of the assumption that we are at the bottom, that the bearish sentiment is peaking, because we haven't even started yet. But you might say, what about the cash on the sidelines? All of these trillions are going to save us at some point. All of that cash is going to go to work at some point. Wrong. Look at the correlation between the world index versus the G10 excess liquidity index in yellow. Every time excess liquidity went down, it was a leading indicator that the global equities index in white is going to follow through and drop along with the drop of excess liquidity and vice versa. What are we seeing right now? We're seeing excess liquidity dropping like a rock to the same level it dropped to back in the crash of 2020, which means the global equities could follow through and drop further. Here's another one. You might say that the pain is already too much. I have certain stocks that are down 80, 90% from the top. This has got to be the bottom, Maverick, right? Wrong. Look at the NYSE new 52-week highs minus the new 52-week lows. It is in yellow. And then we have the S&P 500 in white. We are not even close to peak panic and peak selling. It could get a lot worse. The yellow indicator could drop down all the way to the levels we saw back during the crash of 2020. Another one, when we look at the advance to decline index in yellow and then the S&P 500 in white, yes, we have more stocks declining than advancing. And it is reaching extreme negative readings. But who's to say that we're not going to go further to the downside? and have more negative readings, just like we saw back during the crash of 2020. Here's another indicator for you. When we look at the short versus term volatility ratio in yellow versus the S&P 500 in white, as you can see, we're not even close to the capitulation levels, quote unquote. It could get a lot worse. This indicator could go down to match the readings that we saw back during the sell-off 2018 and 2020. Things could get a lot worse here. But this is the indicator that market bulls place all of their bets on, the American Association of Individual Investors. Investors double A double I index, and it certainly shows extreme bearish readings. But here's the problem I just showed you technical indicators more reliable indicators that show we could see a lot more pain. We haven't seen the extreme bearish sentiment yet. And another point, every time the AA I index went to these negative readings, it was for a reason. There was fundamental reasons in the case of 2018 for example with the fed hikes or the panic of 2020 but in every single time the fed intervened to rescue the stock market and in every instance we must ask the question where would have the equities market been absent of the fed's intervention who's to say that we could have seen worse levels in the s&p 500 so this indicator will work as a contrarian indicator so long as the fed intervenes to rescue the market when we get to these extreme bearish levels. The million dollars question right now is, will the Fed intervene to rescue the stock market this time around? How? They're already out of ammo. We're talking about tightening. We're talking about increasing interest rates because we have this time around, unlike others, we have inflation. And it's not just a transitory inflation or a tamed inflation. We have inflation that at least according to the official data, which we know this is cooked data, a watered down reading of the actual inflation reading in the economy. But regardless, this reading of 7.9% CPI inflation way exceeds the Fed's target of 2%. Meaning, are you out of your mind expecting the Fed to rescue the equities market right now? If anything, they're out of ammo. Are they going to pile on the misery here by increasing interest rates as slow and gentle 
these interest rate hikes might be, this is still tightening, not easing. Now, perhaps a better indicator for the bulls should be the action that we saw in the VIX in the last three days, because equities were going down, and so was the VIX. Usually, equities go down, and that comes hand in hand with hedging activities, buying puts, which spikes the VIX higher. But this is not what we saw in the last three days of trading, at least. So what is going on with the VIX here? And could it be this is the indicator that we need to read ahead and figure out that we have a reversal and a rally to come in the stock market perhaps but be careful here i'm gonna read for you what the wall streeters say and indeed the wall streeters look at this indicator as a sign that the stock market is about to bottom and it's about to rally again but be cautious and heed this warning in my opinion what we've seen so far from the VIX is an indicator of a pause in hedging activities, not a peak in hedging. Very important distinction. Why would we have a pause in hedging activities? Because we saw a lot of hedging as of late. That's number one. Number two, we have an important Fed announcement. We have some progress in the talks between Russia and Ukraine. We have mysterious activities in the commodities market, dropping oil and wheat and palladium dramatically. But most importantly, market participants decided to take a pause, keyword pause, in hedging because we have an important Fed meeting. And we know that the Fed will increase interest rates by 25 basis points. That is in the bag right now. But the most important question is, what will the Fed say? What will Jerome Powell say regarding the path ahead? Are we going to have an autopilot policy of 25 basis points in each meeting? Or are they going to be more calculated than that? Perhaps he can sound more dovish that if things worsens in the broader economy, he could actually go back into easing or delaying interest rate hikes. Perhaps the Fed will not unwind the balance sheet right away. All of these will cause the stock market to spike higher. And hence, we did not see hedging activities in the last three days, even though the indices were trading down. So with that perspective out of the way, let's hear what the Wall Streeters are saying about this, the mystery of the VIX. Beyond traders getting used to one day's tumble becoming the next day's bounce, big shifts in institutional positioning could also be underpinning a sturdier foundation. Client data from JP Morgan Chase Prime Brokerage shows long short hedge funds slashed risky positions for seven consecutive days leading to the fastest de-risking in more than a year we're back to another point of people being well hedged and well positioned and this is according to rbc's derivative strategist amy Wu silverman she also added you are also seeing people selling that volatility and doing some overriding that can probably dampen volatility. So we have people riding VIX calls. And some market participants see that as a contrarian indicator that perhaps volatility is peaking. Otherwise, why would a large bank ride upside calls and assume that risk unless they know that the VIX is peaking? Continuing, the defensive posture was evident in the trading volume of bearish versus bullish options. The 20-day average of the CBOE put call ratio for equities hovered near a 22-month high a sign of caution here it is so we already have a lot of people who are hedged already hedged they already bought their puts they're ready if things get worse so they're not buying more at least for now but look at the chart right here things could get a lot worse because we're coming out of two years almost two years worth of complacency no hedging no shorting at all just putting blindfolds on running naruto style buying the dip every single time no hedging needed no plan b needed why because the fed has been accommodative so who's to say that we're not going to see the pull to call ratio this is the 20 days moving average who's to say that we're not going to see that spike a little higher back to the normal levels by the way from 2016 all the way to 2020 and who's to say that the put to calls ratio is not going to spike to match the panic selling that we saw as you can see in the chart back in 2020 we have a long way to go if the put to calls ratio wants to move higher and hence we are not at panic selling yet we are not a panic bearish sentiment yet but let's hear what the wall streeters say despite thursday's retreat the vix has held above 30 for nine straight days a stretch of elevation not seen since june 2020 jarring reversals have been coming almost daily in 2022 as traders struggled to get a grip 
on the path of economic growth and fresh uncertainties around monetary policy following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So I read this as we have a batch of market participants who have yet to hedge because they're placing their bets, we have this Russia-Ukraine situation, and the Fed will have no other choice but to be dovish. They're assuming that the Fed has to reverse the hawkish stance, and they're placing all of their bets that the Fed will come to the rescue once again, and equities will blast higher once again. So they haven't hedged yet. And this could be dangerous, because who's to say that these people will not finally come up to their senses and say, you know what, the Fed is out of ammo, this Russia-Ukraine situation continues to go on, and oh, by the way, inflation continues to move higher, we must start hedging now. And here comes the next badge of hedging and buying of the VIX. Back to the Wall Streeters. Professional speculators that make both bullish and bearish equity wages have seen their notional equity exposure fall 25% from one year high. This is according to JP Morgan. But listen to this, because this is important. While their levels of leverage have yet to match Troth reached during the pandemic route in March 2020, or the sell-off in December 2018, the seven-day risk unwind approached the typical duration of degrossing during times of stress. Eight to 12 days. To JP Morgan's analysts, including John whatever, the furious unwinding suggests that the market may have gone through the worst part of deleveraging should the geopolitical news start to improve. So again, they're pointing out that we could see a lot more pain, just like we saw back in 2020 and 2018. But they're reading it, at least according to JP Morgan, from a time duration perspective, that usually this is the typical period where we see deleveraging, and hence perhaps the worst of the sell-off is behind us. Once again, this is an assumption, not written in stone. Continuing, while a lot will depend on how key events over the next week and fall, the magnitude of recent de-risking, especially among discretionary equity LS funds, suggests that we could be closer to the end than the beginning of the discretionary de-risking, the analysts wrote in a note to clients. Christopher Jacobson, strategist at Susquehanna, noted some tail hedging in the VIX via a couple of large ratio call spreads in the past week. On Monday, for example, one investor sold 10,000 bullish contracts with a strike price at 40 to buy 60,000 calls, betting the VIX would rise to 90, with both expiring in June. What does that mean? Somebody sold 10,000 contracts for the VIX 40 calls with the expiration date of June. And then they used some of these proceeds to buy 60,000 contracts of the 90 calls for the same expiration date in June. Now, why would they do that? It is an interesting strategy. Number one, you're betting that the VIX is peaking. And by selling the 10,000 contracts of the 40 calls, you're betting that the VIX will be below 40 by June. The problem is you're not sure how high the spike will take us before the peak. And if that happens, this trader wants to capture some of that volatility by selling more contracts of the 90 calls than the 10,000 contracts he sold for the 40 calls. In other words, what if the sell-off intensifies? and we see the VIX shooting up to 100, then this trader has the flexibility to sell at least 50,000 contracts of the 90 bucks calls he bought in the VIX and still be covered as a credit call spread by the expiration date of June. So let's say we have a panic. The VIX pops all the way to 100. Let's say by May. This trader will have the opportunity to sell at least 50,000 contracts that he already owns on the 90 bucks calls in the VIX. But then the bet is that the VIX will go down below 40 by June, which is the expiration date. In other words, this trader has the same sentiment that I just outlaid for you. Yes, we have indicators that say the VIX is peaking. Yes, we have indicators that say we are at peak bearish sentiment. But who's to say that it's not going to get worse before the peak? And hence, the trader is structuring this trade to benefit from all scenarios. Of course, the worst outcome for this trader is if the VIX remains elevated above 40 by the expiration date of June, which is a long shot. So the risk versus reward is worth it for this trade. Continuing. When implied volatility is high, the same 1% move lower is much more expected, quote-unquote, so the risk generally won't be the same upward pressure on volatility 
and in fact it might decline, end quote. And this is according to Jacobson. He also added, along the same lines, investors at that point have had more opportunity and time to hedge. So those same market moves may not lead to as much hedging activity. And that could indeed explain the weird action that we saw with the VIX in the last three days. But my interpretation is a little different. My interpretation says we're seeing a pause, not a retreat from hedging activities. Why do we have the pause? The answer is awaiting the Fed's decision. And what Jerome Powell is going to say. And if Powell, for example, says, you know what? Inflation is just way out of whack. I'm going to have to do seven, eight interest rate hikes this year. Boom. The stock market will take a leg down, a big one, and we will see more hedging activities. And hence, it is a pause, not a peak, at least for now. And with that, folks, let's proceed to the market analysis last week and the outlook for this week. So let's start by going over the performance of indices last week. And here we go. On Friday, the Dow Industrial Average was down 229.88 points or a decline of 0.69%. The Nasdaq leading the decliners of the day down 286.15 points or a decline of 2.18%. The S&P 500 was also down 55.21 points or a decline of 1.30%. And here are the sector's performance of Friday, all in the red, no medals given, and the decliners were led by cyclicals, technology, and communication services. Now, let's Let's contrast this with the weekly sector's performance, and again, all of them in the red. Energy was pretty much flat, but yet in the red. Even energy was sold this week. What does that say? Remember the S&P death cross? The 50 is about to cross the 200. It has been holding and outperforming the Dow and the Nasdaq due to the outperformance of energy. But if energy starts to go down, then the death cross will happen, and then all bets are off, because who's left to hold the S&P 500 without energy? But anyhow, for the week. The last laggards were led by defensives, cyclicals, and technology. And here is the advance to decline ratios on Friday, NYSE 26% advancing versus 71% declining. The Nasdaq 25% advancing versus 70% declining. Moving on to commodities, and this is the picture as of the time of the recording of this video. Certain futures are already trading, others are still closed. But as you can see, we're watching crude oil, we're watching palladium, we're watching wheat, and gold. These are the important ones. And so far, we have a divergence. Brent is trading higher. WTI is trading down. Palladium was down on Friday. Wheat was down. And now it is recovering a little bit. So what I want to do is look at some of these charts. And we start with the WTI. This is the important one. And we're looking at an hourly chart again. The most important levels are 115.52. That was broken right away. And I told you, I tweeted about it. The moment it's broken, we will see a flush down. And exactly this is what happened. And we're now flirting at around 106.75. If that is broken, then we have to zoom out to a daily chart because it's going to go down all the way to retag and retouch the trend line in yellow, which was resistance before. So now it should serve as support. And this will be a massive decline from the top. We're talking from 130 all the way down to around 100. The WTI could lose. 30% from the top. But again, in my opinion, this is an unwinding of the positioning and speculation ahead of the Russia-Ukraine invasion. Yet the fundamentals are supportive for the WTI to be above 130. What does that mean? The dip will be bought. Make no mistake about it. What about palladium, a monthly chart, another important indicator to the Russia-Ukraine conflict? We had the reverse head and shoulder formation. It played out. This was followed by a bull flag pattern under a sloping line of resistance. And then came the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And here we go, the pop, the breakout, impulsive rally higher. But it is reversing. It is working out overbought conditions on the technicals. Look at the RSI. This is monthly. Look at the weekly, the daily, all way overbought. So if palladium goes down, retag the sloping line of resistance, now supposedly support, it could bounce higher again. But I don't think it's going to go down there. I think this chart will rally before going back to retag the sloping line of resistance, now support, because the momentum is so strong. I think some of the air is going to come out, some profit takers, will indeed do so. But then those waiting on the sidelines, the dip buyers, are you going to buy the dip in RKK, DD, the tech stocks? Of course not. You buy the dip in these hot commodities that are now momentum trades. So my bet 
is palladium will recover before retagging the sloping line. What about wheat? Here's a monthly chart for the continuous contract of wheat. And as you can see, we had the saucer bottoming formation. And then, as you will see when we zoom in, a reverse head and shoulder formation. Then came the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And here we go, the breakout above 950, which was resistance, now should be support. And the chart went all the way to challenge the highs from 2008, which is around 1,350. The bet for now, this is a really hard trade. It got impulsive. It got way overboard on the technicals, be it daily, be it weekly, be it monthly. Some of that air is going to come out, but you're not going to be able to substitute the fundamentals that we have a shortage, a massive shortage of wheat, at least 25% of the world's production is gone now. We're not going to be able to print 3D wheat. The fundamentals, the tailwinds are still intact and they will support higher wheat prices. Absent of a peace agreement, a ceasefire, and the removal of the sanctions, my bet is wheat will shoot up higher and it will break above the double top that you see right now at around 1,350. And this is a daily chart. Again, it's a pullback. You're working out all of these overbought conditions, but who's to say we're not going to see buying of the dip again and that wheat will make it above 1,350 easily. Moving on, the options market, the big casino. Here's the summary of the action on Friday. The hottest table by far was Apple at around 1.4 million contracts. About 56% of those bets were calls. And a number two, Tesla, the souffle with around 850,000 contracts, about 54% of those were calls. And number three, watch out for this name. We're seeing some call options buying, NEO. It traded around 700,000 contracts for this name on Friday. About 58% of those were calls. And here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. And here it is, the ticker NIO NEO. This time around, they bought calls, buying the dip, the 18 calls for the expiration date, March 18th, with expectations that NEO could rebound higher by more than 12% by then. They paid about 50 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1 million. What about the ticker FSLY Fastly? Beaten down, but somebody is betting for more declines to come by buying the 12.5 puts for the expiration date, April 14th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 10% by then. They paid about 90 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.3 million. What about the ticker FXY? A lot of pain for Chinese equities last week. Unbelievable crash, because that's what it was. But somebody's buying the dip betting for a rebound. In this case, they bought the 32 calls for the expiration date, April 14th, with the expectations the name could rebound higher by more than 10% by then. They paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $700,000. Notice they're buying calls on NEO and the FXY. Maybe Chinese equities will outperform this week, we'll see. What about the trade for the ticker HAS for Hasbro? This time around, they're buying puts, in this case the 80 puts for the expiration date, April 14th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 7.5% by then. They paid about one buck and 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.3 million. And lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the QQQ, the NASDAQ? The buying calls, interesting, the 344 calls for the expiration date, April 22nd. With expectations that the name could rebound higher by more than 6% by then, they paid about 5 bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $3.5 million. Now a lot has to go right for this trade to work out. Among them, Jerome Pound not being too hawkish. We know that 25 basis points is in the bag, but what if he says we're going to have a wait and see approach rather than the autopilot interest rate hikes. That will be positive for the stock market, certainly positive for the queues. Likewise, what if we have a ceasefire agreement between Russia and Ukraine? That could also spike the queues higher. But for now, that seems to be a long shot, yet somebody's betting on it. Moving on to the heat map analysis, and again, it's a sea of red on Friday, with few exceptions. Oracle reported earnings, moved higher, Uber announced price hikes. We're going to talk about it 
in a minute, but we also had Pfizer moving higher, rebounding, Deer, Union Pacific, some of these momentum trade as of late managed to perform, but fertilizers were down pretty much flattish, Energy, Exxon, Chevron were flattish, the high beta energy names, some of them were down big, so stick with the big guys. I know that the high beta names are sexy to trade, but in the long run, your portfolio would thank you if you stick with Exxon, Chevron, BP, maybe certain countries' ETFs that happen to be a net producer of oil and gas. And the last exception of Friday was McDonald's, the ticker MCD, which was trading higher on short covering. The name was down big for the week. Again, we're talking about 10% of the revenues from Russia poof, gone. That's going to cause a lot of pain for the stock. Now, let's contrast this action with the picture for the week. Now, we have more winners. You can see them clearly. They happen to be mostly the green energy names, in this case, solar. Solar performed. Then we have the big pharma names, also at performed. And the recent momentum trades, we're talking about fertilizers, mosaic, nutrin. We're talking about gold. We're talking about energy, specifically Chevron. Look at the contrast between Chevron and Exxon. Chevron up almost 8% for the week. Exxon pretty much flat. We talked about the rotation from Exxon to Chevron a little over a week ago. Likewise, in industrials, some of the momentum trades happen to be Caterpillar and Deer. These also outperformed. The railroads, Union Pacific in specific, also outperformed, be it closing on the downside. Yet we have other momentum trades that did not outperform, namely Kroger, ADM, Archer Daniels, the defense stocks, Lockheed, Raytheon, Northrop, but here's the good news for defense and why you should continue to buy the dips in these names. We talked about the deal with Indonesia, over $10 billion worth of deal. Then we talked about selling tanks from General Dynamics to Poland, another deal worth multi-billions of dollars. And we have more deals to come here, folks. We talked about Germany upping defense spending by almost $20 billion a year. A lot of that's going to go in the pockets of Lockheed, Northrop, Raytheon. Australia is also hiking up spending for defense higher by the tune of $20 billion. Now we have Sweden also upping defense spending to about 2% of GDP. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars. Also going to Lockheed, Raytheon, Northrop. We also have Slovakia which will receive the F-16 fighter jets a little later than expected, but they're going to up defense spending, and the reason is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. On top of that, we have another deal with Saudi Arabia, which will produce air defense missiles, but these will be co-produced with Lockheed Martin. So again, the tailwinds for defense contractors are still intact, and they continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger as more countries up their defense spending. Another notable mover for the week was Didi, we should say for the day, because it was down 44% on Friday alone. And this will produce more pain for SoftBank and Uber. Both are big investors in Didi. And this could be a double whammy for Uber, because with the rise in gasoline prices, drivers are complaining. So now Uber is imposing a temporary surcharge on U.S. customers to soften the blow to drivers for mounting gas prices. The question here is, Will this cause more customers to decide not to take an Uber because of cost increases or will they be receptive and just pay the surcharge? In any case, this is a bad development for Uber because more drivers would choose not to work anyways with or without the surcharge because if we continue to see gasoline prices moving higher, certain drivers with certain vehicles will be priced out. So keep Uber in your watch list and better yet, if we're going to see pain for Uber, what do you think will happen to Lyft? Now, let's talk about automobile manufacturers because we have Honda, which I've been talking about since the beginning of the year and has been a top performer. Year to date, it was up almost 11%, but now it's down 8% year to date because they're boycotting Russia. This will be a massive hit to sales, no doubt about it. On top of that, all of these shortages of materials right now, palladium, neon, chips, and the insane shipping rates will cost these companies tremendously, no doubt about it. And therefore, we're seeing these automobile manufacturers shutting production altogether. Honda shutting production by 10% in two factories. And then we have Toyota also scaling back production in Japan because chips are nowhere to be found. So you have to make a decision here. Whether to keep Honda, Toyota, GM, Ford, it goes to all of them or whether you dump them. I'm up on Ford. I'm probably going to take some profits there. I'm now down in Honda. But my take is the following. If this energy crisis will
people and incentivize our deal leaders to invest more in EVs and perhaps offer more credits and incentives, then we will see these EV stocks performing sooner or later. When you look at all of these EV stocks, which ones have the better valuations? It's not going to be Tesla that's going to rally higher. Tesla will have problems in the Fed increasing interest rates, which will result in multiple contraction. On the other hand, a name like Honda is dirt cheap and it's about to scale up their EV production. It did not get the bump that we saw with Toyota, GM, BW, Ford, Tesla, the EV bump. Honda did not get that. So my bet is at some point Honda will. But you also have to use your head. The entire industry is facing a massive hit with these shortages and scaling back production. And oh, by the way, removing the Russian market entirely. That's a lot of pain. So you have to choose what is the maximum pain point. Meaning what is the point where you say, okay, I'm bailing out. It might have been a great idea, but it is no longer the case because A, B, C, and D. I have my point where I'm going to abandon the trade in Honda. You got to have yours too if you happen to be involved in this trade. What about Revion? Revion was down big this week. At first, they announced price hikes, and the assumption was okay, here's a company that can beat inflation because you're not going to be able to survive as an auto manufacturer right now in this environment, absent of price hikes and the pricing power because the prices of materials aluminum copper nickel and the list goes on and on the prices of these materials are moving higher and higher and higher with no stop in sight this will crush the margin of all auto manufacturers so which one has the pricing power well it turns out that revion doesn't have pricing power because there was a consumer backlash right away. And now Revion saying, you know what? The production is not going to go ahead as planned. And therefore, shares tumbled big time. I mean, it's amazing to me that this company at some point was worth more than GM and Ford. It was nonsense. It was irrational to begin with. And even after the sell-off, the valuation of Revion remains irrational. We have a long way to go to the downside here. Moving on to the weekly heat map for the ETFs. Inverse indices led the gains, the SQQs, the SPXU, but not the VIX ETFs. The VXS, the UVXY were pretty much flat. We already talked about this divergence in the beginning of this video, but energy still outperforming, the XLE, the XOP, but besides that, everything was down, besides the XBY for biotech. And this is really interesting. Biotech, the high beta, high multiple names, managed to outperform. This could be due to Moderna. Moderna popped higher this week. The name is oversold. We're seeing some short covering. So I take that with a grain of salt. When we talk about growth versus value, both of them are down, but value still outperformed growth. Gold continues to outperform the GDX was higher for the week, so was the OIH for energy, managed to outperform the XLE and the XOP. So when you pick your energy ETFs, you want to look at the details. Which one are you really betting on? Exxon, Chevron, the high beta refiners. But we also have TAN, the solar ETF, moving higher. URA, uranium, also moving higher. Now, when we talk about international ETFs, believe it or not, European markets outperformed the rest of them, even the EWZ. And the loser was... Chinese equities, FXY, MCHY, down big, unbelievable losses in the Chinese ETFs. So is this a buy the dip opportunity for European equities? Not really. I see this as short covering slash oversold rallies. When we look at the ad performance of European equities versus US equities, year to date, everything was hunky-dory, even though they were down too. But they were ad performing because there was more value in European equities than US ones. And it was the consensus among Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and the rest of them, that European equities will outperform the US. So far, so wrong. Because European equities since the invasion underperformed US equities. Both of them are down, but the underperformance came from European equities. I'd stick to the EWZ, Brazil, Canada, EWC, and Australia, EWA. But better yet, I'm going to pick individual names within the Canadian and Australian markets. When it comes to Brazil, I'm going to stick to the EWZ. And with that, let's move on to the charts analysis. And we start with a 30 minutes chart for the SPY, the S&P 500. The bulls were betting on a series of higher lows. Well, it appears for now that we have broken that series. We have a lower low, at least for now. The chart lost the support of 422 in a gap and crap scenario. It didn't even make it to the line in the sand at around 430. This is an extreme bearish development, but you don't want to bet on it. Why? We have the Fed. Until the Fed moves out of the way, we're not going to make any bets, at least for me. If I have shorts, 
that I've been sitting on and I have massive gains, I might cover those. But besides that, I'm not making any move this week until the Fed gets out of the way. The assumption for now, this chart should move all the way down, retag the support at around 410 and a half, and then we'll take it from there. If we have a double bottom at 410 and a half, and then we have the Fed being quote unquote accommodative, then I'm interested in buying this chart or the chart on its own makes it above 430 and recaptures that important level as support then i'm interested but besides that i'm a spectator right now i'm not even shorting i'm not going to short until the support of 410 and a half is lost for good what about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the spy the s p 500 when we look at the volume it is below average on the selling side you combine this with the vix and you could come up with a conclusion a valid one that we're seeing a dry out in the selling volume there are no sellers left, at least for now. This is a bullish indicator, not a bearish one. Likewise, the momentum indicators, they're negative, but still flat, weighing out the options to move higher or down. If the selling is drying out and the sellers are not showing up, then the buyers will show up. And this will move the chart higher and we will see a recovery in the momentum indicators the rsi and the macd but here's the problem we have important levels to look out for the most important one and let's draw the lines 4102 why is this one important because we have a sloping line of resistance and the argument from the bull side is the following what if the chart is curling its way higher in a source or bottoming higher low kind of pattern sooner or later it's gonna crack above the sloping line in yellow which is resistance for now the bears would argue and say forget about it i'll see it when i believe it because so far you've been struggling to keep 4232 as support sooner or later we'll see you down there at 4102 when we get there if the chart fails to bounce in a double bottom formation that will seal the deal and initiate another shorting signal another flush down we'll get there when we get there but for now who has the better argument is it the bulls or is it the bears i'd say the bulls for now because they have the volume on their side they have the momentum indicators still covering for their side they have the higher low they have the Fed. all of these could be factors favoring the bulls we could see a rally this upcoming week the problem is all of that hope goes out of the window immediately once the level of 4102 is broken then we know it's over and we have a shorting signal moving on to the queues 30 minutes chart again a gap and crap a failure to even recapture 334 as support and we're now looking down at 316.46 as support i'm being a little more conservative here because we have support at around 320 we also have a gap the chart pretty much closed right at the gap it could rebound right away but i'm being a little more conservative here i'm not gonna buy until i see one of two things number one a rebound from 316.46 or the chart on its own recaptures 343 the line in the sand as support absent of that i'm just watching here what about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the nasdaq we have a rebound from target number one which is the yellow trend line we could go to target number two which is the previous low but we're not there yet we have the support 13,300 intact on top of that look at the volume it is receding below average you combine that with the vix and you could make a solid argument that we're seeing the sellers pretty much maxing out we're seeing sellers exhaustion if the sellers stop selling the buyers will show up and we will see all of these charts moving higher including this one because the bulls would argue if we switch to a line chart we have a sloping line of resistance but we're also seeing a saucer bottoming formation we're seeing higher lows we're seeing the selling drying out and hence the saucer bottoming sooner or later this chart will find its way and break above the sloping line of resistance once again all of that is good but here's the problem you lose all of that hope once the yellow trend line which is target number one is broken as support then we have to go down all the way to 12,766 and all of that hope goes away moving on to the IWM the Russell 2000 30 minutes chart again a gap and crap stopping right at 196 and a half for support the IWM has been performing a lot better than the SPY in the queues at least last week and this could be a leading indicator that the market is indeed bottoming and it's about to rally higher the problem is it all depends on the fed if the fed doesn't deliver and we don't have a russia ukraine agreement then we will see lower lows 
No doubt about it. And hence, the mystery of the VIX. The VIX stopped moving higher. It is pausing for now, waiting whether we have an agreement between Russia and Ukraine. And what will the Fed do? If we have an affirmation of what has been going on for a while now, year to date, the fears of tightening, the fears of the Russia-Ukraine conflict pushing inflation higher, this chart would lose 196.5 as support and then some. It will go down all the way 188, perhaps below that. And therefore, I'm not doing anything this week. Matter of fact, I'm going to be a spectator, and that's all there is. Moving on to the Dixie, a daily chart for the dollar index. We have a reversal of the reversal right away. We told you this is tricky Dixie after all. It's not going to stop. You think it's dead, but it's not. The conflict goes on. For now, the assumption is the Fed will continue to tighten, and this will support the dollar higher. Not because the dollar is great, but because we have other currencies weakening. And we're now looking at 99.9 .9 as the next resistance. But sooner or later, these overbought technical conditions on the RSI and the MACD will play out. We just don't know when and where. When? the time and where the pricing point. Moving on to gold, one of these hot momentum trades right now. Look at the RSI, the MACD indicators. They're way overbought, overextended, but is the chart working out these overbought conditions by a crash, a massive pullback, a gap and crap, or is it working out these overbought technicals via consolidation, which is bullish, not bearish, meaning we're seeing some profit taking, but we're also seeing some dip buyers jumping in, meaning that the demand remains hot for gold. If that is the case, it is just a matter of time before the overbought technicals no longer be, and we see gold moving higher again. We'll know that is not the case if gold breaks the support of the next Fibonacci level at around 1,910. Moving on to a daily chart for the 10-year yield. Perhaps the most important chart to watch this upcoming week because of the Fed decision. For now, we have a vertical rally higher. Inflation expectations are moving higher. And for now, that trumps the safety trade of buying the TLT and bonds. We saw the 10-year yield moving down. when We saw a rush to safety in buying bonds at the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war. But at some point, this will normalize. It will become the new normal, that we have a war between Russia and Ukraine. But what are we left with right now? Higher inflation expectations due to the conflict. Hence, the 10-year yield is recovering higher. This chart will only go down if the Fed comes out with a dovish outlook. Here's the TLT, a weekly chart. The good news for the TLT bugs, the hope is still alive because the chart did not close below 134.5. But again, with inflation expectations moving higher and the normalization of the Russia-Ukraine war, you're not going to see a rush to buying bonds right now, absent of the Fed having a dovish outlook. Here's the VIX, 4 hours chart. As you can see, dropped down in the last two days, even though the indices were also down. You look at the MACD indicator. It is now showing red impressions on the histogram, and this is the first time we're seeing divergence of this indicator. Every time we have a crossing showing red impressions on the histogram of the VIX from a 4 hours perspective, we see a pump higher in the SPY. This is the first time since at least the summer of last year when this indicator failed. But look at what's going on right now it is curling its way higher. It remains elevated above 20. So the bears can argue all they want that we will see lower lows in the indices and they will have their arguments supported by this chart of the VIX, the fact that it is trading above 20. Now, here's how the bulls would counter. They would say you had a pattern of higher lows that is now broken. On top of that, the chart lost 33 as support, at least for now. Who's to say that sooner or later, this chart's not going to work its way to the downside and revisits 20 as support sooner or later? If that is the case, then the SPY will move higher. The bulls will lose the argument right away if the VIX moves higher and recaptures 33 as support. The bears will lose the argument right away if we go down to 20. Who has the better argument right now? Is the chart closer to 20 or closer to 33? The answer is it is closer to 33, and therefore the bears have the better argument here. When we look at the weekly chart for the VIX, for example, we have a source or bottoming. We're facing the resistance at around 32, 33, but sooner or later, this chart is going to move its way higher. The momentum is accelerating as this chart moves higher. What about the VXN? Four hours chart for the VIX for the NASDAQ. We have a crossing in the MACD indicator showing red impressions on the histogram. But again, this could be a false indicator this time around, as we discussed throughout this video. The pattern has yet to make lower lows. So NASDAQ bears 
still have the stronger argument here. The bulls could turn the table the moment we have a lower low pattern. We also have a break above 27 and a half. Absent of that, the bears continue to be in charge. And perhaps this is another indicator favoring the NASDAQ bears. How about a daily chart for Apple? Look at Apple, the most important stock in the market right now, losing the support of 156. And it's now looking down at 150. The volume is moving higher on the selling side. Both momentum indicators, the RSI and the MACD, remain in negative divergence. This is the most important stock in the market by far. And better yet, when we remove all of these markings on the chart and we turn on the 200 day days moving average uh oh if we don't get a rebound from the 200 days moving average and this chart starts closing daily below the 200 days moving average run for the hills we have more pain to come what about tesla the souffle and hourly chart we talked about the sloping line of resistance in yellow and the moment you break below that line you will see a flush down and this is exactly what happened on friday now here's the problem you guys have been watching this chart with me for days now and we have an error a mistake it says the low 728 and a half are you guys jerking off while you're watching these videos you have Pornhub on the other tab because this error has been here for days and nobody pointed out would I make a grammar mistake or a pronunciation mistake the pitchforks come out in the comments section oh it's not is it's has bro I speak four languages bitch how many can you speak barely English right so here it is the actual number is 782 and a half and of course if tesla closes the day below 782 and a half this will be a shorting signal all the way to the previous low at 700 moving on to btc bitcoin tulips what's going on here not good we have the triple top and the chart made a lower high and it is now in bearish consolidation a bear flag consolidation sooner or later it's going to break down to revisit 35,750 not buying it unless we have a reading above 42,000 and better yet a reading above the triple top and lastly moving on to amc an hourly chart uh oh tick tock baby we're now down a 14.24 the last support if that is broken then we're going down at 10 folks so the apes better perform a miracle because nothing short of that will save this stock moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar for this week on monday tomorrow we have the one and three year inflation expectations we got the five on friday now we're going to stitch all of that information together and we'll find out whether we're going to have a recession or not because if the one year inflation expectations starts to surpass the three and the five-year inflation expectations and that gets us closer and closer to our recession on tuesday march 15th we have the ppi highly important the producer price index and then we have another important indicator in the empire manufacturing index wednesday march 16th we have retail sales the import price index the home builders index but most importantly the much anticipated and perhaps the most important fed meeting in recent memory at least since 2009 the fomc announcement and the press conference by criminal powell thursday march 17th we have initial jobless claims then we have the building permits housing starts the Philly Fed Manufacturing Survey, the Industrial Production Index, and the Capacity Utilization Rate. And lastly, March 18th, Friday, we have existing home sales, the leading economic indicators. And with that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.